go into the world. And tell every man that you meet, there is a man on the cross. A Catholic take. What you need to know right now. A bold synthesis of inspiration and information. Keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous Catholic perspective. A Catholic Take with Joe McLean starts now. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. The rigging of a synod. Whew. No, I'm not talking about this current one. Or am I? Uh, Edward Penton is going to be our guest at 30 past the hour. He has a book out called The Rigging of a Vatican Synod. This was an investigation of alleged manipulation at the Extraordinary Synod on the Family. You might remember 2014, 2015. There was a lot that went down at that synod that many of us seem to have forgotten. Uh, Lots of uh, accusations of manipulations in the Run up to the event in the event itself, there was like a little mini revolt on the floor of the synod. I mean, it was a big deal. Then there was a book published by by several cardinals that got passed out to all the bishops, and there was lots of lots of shenanigans that are surrounded that event. So we're going to conversate about all of that, plus the infamous Cardinal Casper remarks to Edward Penton with Edward Penton. At 30 past the hour. Do join us for that if you can. At 15 past the hour, 14 past the hour, I want to share with you a project that we've been working on, the Lepanto poem by G.K. Chesterton. I'm very excited about it. I think the team did a great job, and we're going to be rolling that out for you in this program, so stick around for that as well as so many other pieces of news, information, of course, over the weekend, terrible news coming out of both Israel and Israel. And Afghanistan, I'm going to share that with you coming up in the news account. Please, let's keep the repose of so many lost in our prayers today. And then we'll be linking to everything in the show notes at the stationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. But let me just say real quick before we jump into prayer and begin, thank you to everybody who donated last week. I mean, our fund drive is, uh, we, we understand how difficult it is to have to come to you and ask you for your hard-earned money, especially in the financial times that we find ourselves in today. But nonetheless, you make it possible for us to do what we do. And thank you for donating and being so very generous to our apostolate. It means the world to us. Thank you again. Let us pray. Let us begin. Let's ask Our Lady for her intercession. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known, that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come. Before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O mother of the word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And now the saint of the day. St. Denis of Paris, pray for us. Some accounts have stated that Dennis of Paris and Dennis the Areopagite are one and the same, though others disagree. In either case, Dennis, or Dionysius, was a bishop who preached throughout Gaul, or what is now France, in the early centuries of the church. He was the bishop of Paris, and from this diocese he directed evangelization and the establishment of other sees throughout France. His success made him a target of the pagans, and eventually he and two companions, a priest named Rusticus and a deacon named Eleutherius, were imprisoned cruelly tortured, and finally beheaded. It is attested that after the decapitation, St. Dennis picked up his own head and carried it several miles while preaching as a sign of the power of God in the face of the pagan persecution. The several saints who have done this at their martyrdom are known as cephalophores. For this reason, St. Dennis is invoked against headaches as one of the 14 holy helpers. St. Genevieve caused the building of the first church in his honor, now a cathedral, and together they are patrons of Paris. St. Denis, or Saint-Denis, is also the patron of the French people, and for centuries the French monarchs were accompanied in battle by a great banner known as the Oriflamme, colored bright red as a symbol of the blood of St. Denis. St. Denis of Paris, pray for us. And now your headline news. The Wall Street Journal reports Iran helped plot attack on Israel over several weeks. 
Iranian security officials helped plan Hamas's Saturday surprise attack on Israel and gave the green light for the assault at a meeting in Beirut last Monday, according to senior members of Hamas and Hezbollah, another Iran-backed militant group. The attack launched by Hamas represents the biggest and deadliest incursion into Israel, with motivations being the disruption of efforts to bring Saudi Arabia and Israel together. The United States calls the attack a terrorist attack by a terrorist organization. And despite the escalation, normalization efforts between Saudi Arabia and Israel should proceed. Several U.S. citizens have been confirmed killed and kidnapped, including students from Nepal, in the Hamas attack on Israel and subsequent fighting. The death toll continues to rise with over 1,110 people, including 413 Palestinians and around 700 Israelis killed since Hamas's launch in their surprise attack. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin has ordered the Ford Carrier Strike Group to sail to the eastern Mediterranean to assist Israel and the attack by Hamas. Ground News reports more than 255,000 apprehended at southern border in September. Last month, there were at least 255,212 foreign nationals apprehended or reported evading capture after illegally entering the southwest border. The most gotaways reported in El Paso and Tucson. Agents reported extremely low gotaway numbers last month in the Yuma sector due to agents being pulled out of the field to address an influx of people at the border wall. This was out of the ordinary. Just this morning, I saw a report of of a huge group of men from, you know, fighting age military men from, you know, terrorist countries coming through a very remote part of the desert. CBP apparently has processed them and they're going to release them into the country. So that's a good time. Hey, Daily Wire is reporting more than 2,500 dead after earthquakes strike Afghanistan. More than 2,500 people have reportedly died after a pair of 6.3 magnitude earthquakes struck part of western Afghanistan on Saturday, marking one of the country's deadliest tr- uh, tremors in the last 20 years. Just last year, a 5.9 magnitude earthquake in June killed more than 1,000 people, leaving tens of thousands homeless. Let us pray for the repose of the souls lost and those that are going to have to deal with the after effects. And those, those are your headline news. Taking the uh, optional gospel today because of St. Dennis, bishop and martyr, from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Jesus said to his disciples, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trodden underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Are you one of those undercover Catholics? Hmm? Are you one of those secret agent Christians? You know, you're you know, you're Christian and all, but nobody at your work knows that. Nobody in your family really gets how how much your faith means to you, how important it is to you. I mean, nobody really understands in your neighborhood just just how Catholic you are. You know what I'm saying? Because like when they look at your house, like nothing about your home speaks, hey, this guy's a Christian. There's no statuary. He's not even like one of those St. Francis birdbath statues, you know, one of those things. Not even one of those. Maybe you got an angel. You might have an angel next to the gnome in the garden. Like, are you are you an undercover Catholic? Because if you are, I want you to meditate upon this passage today. Because let your light so shine before men. Let that sink in today. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father. You know, part of the reason why I wear this is not just to, you know, shout it loud and clear who I am and what I, what I believe and what I'm all about. But it's also to remind myself what who I am, what I'm all about, so that I may try to live that even in the midst of the world. St. Chrysostom would say, not for your own salvation merely, not for your own salvation merely, or for a single nation, but for the whole world is this doctrine committed to you. 
It is not for you then to flatter and deal smoothly with men, but on the contrary, to be rough and biting as salt is. To be rough and biting as salt is. When for thus offending men by reproving them, ye are reviled. Rejoice, for this is the proper effect of salt, to be harsh and grating to the depraved palate. Thus the evil speaking of others will bring you no inconvenience, but will rather be a testimony of your firmness. Close quote, St. Chrysostom, the golden tongue. That was the golden tongue that said that. St. Hilary said, the apostles are preachers of heavenly things, and thus, as it were, salters with eternity, rightly called the salt of the earth, as by the virtue of their teaching, they, as it were, salt and preserve bodies for eternity. St. Augustine would say, by the world, here we must not understand heaven and earth, but the men who are in the world and those who love the world for whose enlightenment the apostles were sent. He goes on to say, the putting the lamp under the corn measure means the preferring bodily ease and enjoyment to the duty of preaching the gospel and hiding the light of good teaching under temporal gratification. What he's saying here is you're making a choice. Do you love this world so much? You just want its comforts. You just want to be happy and comfortable and just having a good time because you're making the wrong choice. If you are, you are to be salt, the biting salt as St. Christopher describes it. Remigius would say, for as the sun sends forth his beams, so the Lord, the son of righteousness, sent forth his apostles to dispel the night of the human race. Much more can be said. Maybe I'll share more for it with you as we go through the hour. But coming up after the break, I want to share with you the battle of Lepanto, our lady of victory, as seen by G.K. Chesterton and produced by the team at the Station of the Cross. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Share us with a friend. be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It's great to be on with you. Coming up at 30 past the hour, we're going to have a conversation with Edward Penton. He is a, a journalist. He writes for EWTN's National Catholic Register as well, I think as well as some of the other outlets. But nonetheless, he's got a book out called The Rigging of a Vatican Synod. And I've been reading this book. I got my copy through Scribd, my uh, subscription on Scribd. And I've been going through it. The first chapter is pure fire. It's so good. And we're going to be talking about that, especially like the infamous, the infamous interview he had with Cardinal Casper during the Synod on the Family, where Casper basically said that they were to ignore the car, the African cardinals because they opposed the push for same sex unions and all the rest, and they were like, ah, what are those? What are those, what are those Africans? No, remember it was an insane comment that didn't go well afterwards. Cardinal Burke got yelled at. I mean, it was a big deal. We're going to have that conversation at thirty past the hour. Do join us if you can. Of course, there's lots of stories in the news, and we are back to linking them in our show notes. We are very grateful again for everybody who donated last week. It really does mean the world to us. And um, we have been working as a team on several special projects. And I got to tell you, part of the reason why we fundraise is because we need we need more teammates. We need more help. We need, for all of the ambitious projects we intend to do, raising the funds so that we can afford the great help to to hire solid Catholics to pay them a livable wage and and do amazing things. It requires a lot of money. And that's why we come to you and ask you for support to not just survive, but to thrive. And one of those projects is the Lepanto project we've been working on now for several weeks. It's the G.K. Chesterton poem. Saturday was October the 7th, the Feast of Our Lady of, of uh, Victory. And I shared that story with you, of course, on Friday. And then when uh, we were able to release this video on, on Saturday, we sent it out to the insider group. I'll be emailing it to the email list as well this week. So if you're not on our email list, can I encourage you? Sign up. Go to the website, thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. Join the inside. As soon as you click on the insider email link there at the top, there's like a little menu there. Go. It'll take you right there. It's a form. 
takes two minutes, no big deal. And yes, yes, I'm going to harass your inbox. I'm going to send you emails mostly once a week, but sometimes, sometimes more, sometimes less. It just depends. But nonetheless, sign up knowing that I'm going to be harassing you in your inbox. Okay. So that's the deal. But in exchange for that, I, when I bug you, I try to give you great stuff. So immediately I'm going to reward you for signing up by giving you a whole list of, uh, of of talks just immediately in your inbox you're going to get a bunch of audio talks that are going to bless you inspire you motivate you challenge you so and then of course you get access to the telegram group and much much more but i'll be emailing little ponto video to you of our production here in uh, in this week's email so make sure to sign up at the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. All right. So now I bring to you the production of the team at the Station of the Cross, GK Chesterton's Lepanto. White founts falling in the courts of the sun, and the Soldan of Byzantium is smiling as they run. There is laughter like the fountains in the face of all men feared. It stirs the forest darkness, the darkness of his beard. It curls the blood-red crescent, the crescent of his lips. For the inmost sea of all the earth is shaken with his ships. They have dared the white republics up the capes of Italy. They have dashed the Adriatic round the lion of the sea. And the Pope has cast his arms abroad for agony and loss and called the kings of Christendom for swords about the cross. The cold Queen of England is looking in the glass. The shadow of the Valois is yawning at the mass. From evening isles, fantastical rings faint the Spanish gun. And the Lord upon the golden horn is laughing in the sun. Dim drums throbbing in the hills half heard where only a nameless throne, a crownless prince has stirred, where risen from a doubtful seat in a half-attained stall, the last knight of Europe takes weapons from the wall, the last and lingering troubadour to whom the bird has sung that once went singing southward when all the world was young. In that enormous silence, tiny and unafraid, Comes up along a winding road, the noise of the crusade. Strong gongs groaning as the guns boom far. Don Juan of Austria is going to the war. Stiff flags straining in the night blast cold. In the gloom black purple, in the glint old gold. Torchlight crimson on the copper kettle drums. Then the tuckets, then the trumpets, then the cannon, and he comes. Don Juan laughing in the brave beard curled. Spurning of his stirrups like the thrones of all the world. Holding his head up for a flag of all the free. Love light of Spain, hurrah! Death light of Africa. Don Juan of Austria is riding to the sea. Mahound is in his paradise above the evening star. Don Juan of Austria is going to the war. He moves a mighty turban on the timeless Oris knees. His turban that is woven of the sunset and the seas. He shakes the peacock gardens as he rises from his ease. And he strides among the treetops and is taller than the trees. And his voice through all the garden is a thunder sent to bring. Black Azrael and Ariel and Ammon on the wing. Giants and the genii, multiplex of wing and eye, whose strong obedience broke the sky when Solomon was king. They rush in red and purple from the red clouds of the morn, from temples where the yellow gods shut up their eyes in scorn. They rise in green robes, roaring from the green hells of the sea, where fallen skies and evil hues and eyeless creatures be. On them the sea valves cluster and the gray sea forests curl, splashed with a splendid sickness in the sickness of the pearl. They swell in sapphire smoke out of the blue cracks of the ground. They gather and they wonder and give worship to Mahound. And he saith, 
Break up the mountains where the hermit folk may hide, and sift the red and silver sands lest bone of saint abide, and chase the Gaurus, flying night and day, not giving rest, for that which was our trouble comes again from the west. We have set the seal of Solomon on all things under sun, of knowledge and of sorrow, and endurance of things done. But a noise is in the mountains, in the mountains, and I know the voice that shook our palaces four hundred years ago. It is he that saith not kismet, it is he that knows not fate. It is Richard, it is Raymond, it is Godfrey at the gate. It is he whose loss is laughter when he counts the wager worth. Put down your feet upon him, that our peace be upon the earth. For he heard the drums groaning, and he heard guns jar. Don Juan of Austria is going to the war. Sudden and still, hurrah, bolt from Iberia. Don Juan of Austria is gone by Alacar. St. Michael's on his mountain. In the sea roads of the north, Don Juan of Austria is girt and going forth. Where the gray seas glitter and the sharp tides shift and the sea folk labor and the red sails lift. He shakes his lance of iron and he clasps his wings of stone. The noise is gone through Normandy. The noise is gone alone. The north is full of tangled things and texts and aching eyes. And dead is all the innocence of anger and surprise. And Christian killeth Christian in a narrow, dusty room. And Christian dreadeth Christ that bath a newer face of doom. And Christian hateth Mary that God kissed in Galilee. But Don Juan of Austria is riding to the sea. Don Juan calling through the blast and the eclipse, crying with the trumpet, with the trumpet of his lips, trumpet that saith, Ha! Domino Gloria! Don Juan of Austria is shouting to the ships. King Philip's in his closet with the fleece about his neck. Don Juan of Austria is armed upon the deck. The walls are hung with velvet that is black and soft as sin. And little dwarves creep out of it, and little dwarves creep in. He holds a crystal phial that has colors like the moon. He touches, and it tingles, and he trembles very soon. And his face is as a fungus of a leprous white and gray, like plants in the high houses that are shuttered from the day. And death is in the phial, and the end of all noble work. But Don Juan of Austria has fired upon the Turk. Don Juan's hunting and his hounds have bayed. Booms away past Italy, the rumor of his raid. Gun upon gun, ha ha! Gun upon gun, hurrah! Don Juan of Austria has loosed the cannonade. The Pope was in his chapel before day or battle broke. Don Juan of Austria is hidden in the smoke. The hidden room in a man's house where God sits all the year. The secret window whence the world looks small and very dear. He sees as in a mirror on the monstrous twilight sea the crescent of his cruel ships whose name is mystery. They fling great shadows forwards, making cross and castle dark. They veil the plumed lions on the galleys of St. Mark. And above the ships are places of brown, black-bearded chiefs. And below the ships are prisons, where with multitudinous griefs, Christian captives, sick and sunless, all a laboring race repines, like a race in sunken cities, like a nation in the mines. They are lost like slaves that swat, and in the skies of morning hung, the stairways of the tallest gods when tyranny was young. They are countless, voiceless, hopeless, as those fallen or fleeing on before the high king's horses in the granite of Babylon. And many a one grows witless in his quiet room in hell, where a yellow face looks inward through the lattice of his cell. And he finds his God forgotten, and he seeks no more a sign. 
But Don Juan of Austria has burst the battle line. Don Juan pounding from the slaughter-painted poop, purpling all the ocean like a bloody pirate sloop, scarlet running over the silvers and the gold, breaking of the hatches up and bursting of the holes, thronging of the thousands up that labor under sea, white for bliss and blind for sun and stunned for liberty. Viva Hispania, Domino Gloria, Don Juan of Austria has set his people free. And Cervantes, on his galley, sets the sword back in its sheath. Don Juan of Austria rides homeward with a wreath. And he sees across a weary land a straggling road in Spain, up which a lean and foolish knight forever rides in vain. And he smiles, but not as sultans smile, and settles back the blade. But Don Juan of Austria rides home from the crusade. of the cross we proudly bring the truths of the catholic faith to countless listeners through radio and mobile devices and we're grateful for the feedback we've received i grew up catholic church haven't been in the catholic church for decades but i'm in the process of working my way back for the simple reason that i needed a place to listen to pro-life pro-family messages catholic radio is it it's a place to hear that message without all the political bias and all that that's going on on news talk radio it changed my life it's the only station i turn on the Catholic station is an answer to prayer. It, it couldn't be more fulfilling. It's helped me learn more about the faith, and it's helped me to deepen my faith as a result of that. It's on continuously in my house, day and night. You can't imagine how much I receive from that channel. If you've been blessed by listening to the Station of the Cross, let us know. Call 1-877-888-6279, extension 112. Then share your testimonial with us. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and here are your headline news. Catholic Vote reports lawmakers ask Biden to not deport homeschooling family. 32 Republican members of Congress signed a letter urging the Biden administration to grant asylum to a Christian homeschooling family threatened with deportation. The lawmakers warned that if the Romiki family are expelled, the German government will likely seek to remove the minor children, who are American citizens, from the custody of their parents, as well as penalize the members of the Romiki family with jail time and punitive fines. Planned Parenthood pushes trans treatments. Planned Parenthood reportedly prescribed estrogen to an 18-year-old autistic boy after a single appointment with a nurse practitioner that lasted just over a half hour. Aaron Sibarium of the Washington Free Beacon reported that Planned Parenthood prescribes hormones to any legal adult without a letter from a therapist or formal diagnosis of gender dysphoria. And the National Catholic Register reports outcome of synod will be welcomed as the will of God, says African Cardinal. Edward Penton asked Cardinal Besungu of Kinshasa whether or not he was concerned that the discussions at the synod may lead to the acceptance of same-sex blessings within the church. And if that happened, will the African bishops accept this as the will of God? To which the Cardinal responded, quote, Synodality is a new way for the church to walk together, hand in hand, towards the shore where the Lord awaits us. This is what synodality is all about. How can we walk together to the shore where the Lord awaits us? And in walking together, how can we face the questions that comfort confront us? And if one of the issues we face concerns the question of LGBT and all that, homosexuality... But when the time comes, the Lord himself, through collective discernment, will tell us the direction to follow. But I wouldn't wish at this point to fall into what might be called a personal opinion, because that would be to depart from the spirit of synodality. Close quote. Yikes. Yikes. At any rate, those are your headline news. 
Hey, can I just uh, give a special shout out? Junior Barra, who's one of our insiders, hangs out with us on Facebook all the time. June recently left a, uh, f- a five star review on the Apple podcast version of A Catholic Take. And can I just tell you how much I appreciate that? God bless you, June. I do appreciate it. I, and all of the there's like 42 reviews there now. Glory be to God. Thank you for that. That really means a lot. We are growing in our actual downloads every single week uh, on the program. So uh, the more we get, the more Apple will show our podcast to strangers, people who might be interested in similar content. So it's a fantastic way to support what we do and help us to reach a wider audience is to go and leave a five-star review in the Apple podcast store. As far as I know... I don't think you can leave reviews. Can you leave a review in the Google Play Store? Can you do that? I'm, there's got to be a way to do that. I'm just not sure how to do it. I think I've looked in the past and couldn't find a, uh, like a, it, did, it wasn't obvious to me anyway. But it, no matter what, I do appreciate everyone who does support us in that way because, again, it does spread the word. So the best way you could do that is go to our website, thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. And you can find not only the way to sign up to the email, uh, the insider email list, you can get the show notes, you can get the podcast as well, all right there at the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. I came across a book that I have been reading. All right. So we're working on getting Edward Penton on the hook here. Uh, he's supposed to be on with us today. But this uh, this book I found very interesting. He posted uh, the final chapter of Rigging of the Vatican Synod. This is a book that's published, I think, by Ignatius Press, and it's about the 2014-2015 Synod on the Family. The subtitle is An Investigation of Alleged Manipulation at the Extraordinary Synod on the Family. And I found it very interesting. So I went and got myself a copy over with my uh, my uh, subscription. Scribd. Do you guys use Scribd? Scribd? Is it Scribd? Is it Scribd? Is it Scribd? Like, I don't even know what it is. But nonetheless... I pay them every single month so that I can have access to a library of books. And this was actually one of the books. So I've been reading this and over the weekend, and I got to tell you, it blows me away. And I'm, I'm hoping and praying that Edward will jump on. We did discuss having him on today. So hopefully he'll, uh, he'll jump on at any moment. Now we can follow up. But do you guys remember? You might not remember. But speaking of African Cardinals, that story that I just read to you about how, uh, this African cardinal was asked by Edward Penton whether or not he was going to be bothered by, by the fact that uh, homosexuality and same-sex blessings are being pushed at the Senate. Is that going to bother him? And the reason why I bring that up is because back in 2014 and 2015, there was also a big push in discussing the family and all the challenges to family. There seemed to be a big push to accept this ideology, to accept, to pave the way for same-sex blessings. And back then, 2014 to 2015, it was the African bishops, you might remember, who pushed back. It was the African bishops who stood up and said, no, absolutely not. I mean, they weren't alone in that. Cardinal Pell and many others, Cardinal Burke, Cardinal Mueller, many people did stand up and push back. But Cardinal Casper got, uh, was being interviewed. He was being uh, asked some questions by Edward Penton after one of the sessions. And he made this bizarre statement about how these, these I, my words, not his, so I'm paraphrasing here. So please do take that because I don't have the quote right in front of me. So take this with some grain of salt because I'm paraphrasing by memory here. My words, so Cardinal Casper basically says those pesky African cardinals, those pesky African bishops, they should just not, they just mind their business. Just leave us alone. Let us do what we're going to do. My words, not his. You should, you should, I will put a link to it so you can read it for yourself Ed, to be more specific. But nonetheless, that, that's what went down. And when that got reported, that didn't go over well. Cardinal Casper got really mad. In fact, he tried, because I interviewed Edward Penton about this story when it first broke uh, back in those days. And uh, Cardinal Casper tried to come out and say that he, that it wasn't true. He hadn't said it. But then Edward Penton p- produces the receipts to the conversation because he, He's a reporter, and that's what he does. And, you know, he even asks, he walks and says, hey, can I ask you some questions? Because he's being interviewed. He's be, I think, if I'm not mistaken, there were other journalists present at that moment. So Edward just joins in and says, can I ask a question? So he's, ans- you know, a- asking and answering. And he produces the recording of the conversation. So now he can't backtrack. You can't say you didn't say it because you actually said it. So the next spin was, well, I didn't know I was being interviewed. 
And yet again, as it turned out, he did because he was being interviewed by other journalists at the moment. Edward Penton comes and says, can I ask a question? So he, in fact, was being interviewed. He, in fact, said it and it was recorded. And um, Cardinal Burke, <laughs> Cardinal Burke gets himself in trouble. Cardinal Burke gets, uh, gets basically chastised by Cardinal Casper because he's uh, he's also telling everybody else about about this statement and standing up for the African bishops. It didn't go well at all. But nonetheless, this is where we're at. These are the times that we live in. This is the challenge that we have to face in uh, in these desperate times. And this book, I'm, I'm not sure why Edward Penton's not on, so mea culpa for that. Um, we, we did follow up, but nonetheless, here we are. So hopefully we'll get him on either either in this hour or we'll reschedule him for for tomorrow possibly. But nonetheless, this is where we're at. There is a grave concern, a grave concern over mass manipulation of these synods. Back in 2014, according to Edward Penton's book, Cardinal Erdo, who was the guy who was who was uh, uh, tasked with drafting the relatio, he got very concerned because after he drafted it, he uh, he gets told by Cardinal Belisari that he is to change it. He's to edit it because he didn't like his draft. I'll quote from Edward Penton's book here. Quote, Cardinal Erdo had, it seemed, drafted the document with the opening line beginning with, Jesus Christ is our master before all others and our only Lord, close quote, and had stated in an, an allusion to Second Timothy that the faithful owe obedience to him, whether it is convenient or not convenient. We're sitting across, and this is Cardinal Erdo explaining, we're sitting across the table from one another, him and Cardinal uh, Balasari, uh, Baldessari. And it says, and he says with a tortured expression on his face, Cardinal Baldessari wants me to change that. Wants you to change what? He wants you to, now it's my words, he's wanting you to ch- take out, he wants you to remove that opening line. Jesus Christ, our master before all others and our only Lord. He didn't want the document to start with that. He had to argue with the cardinal to keep some sense of Christ first and foremost. What world do we live in where a prince of the church would want to remove an opening line that clearly states that Christ is the first and the last, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end? In fact, there was a debate that ensued because Cardinal Erdo in this document, the Relatio, wanted to quote JP2, Benedict XVI, Pope Francis, he required Cardinal to start with Pope Francis and work backwards to, towards Paul VI. Why? So, in other words, take Christ off the uh, out of the beginning, put Pope Francis there. That was the conversation, and that's part of what uh, Edward Penton writes in the book. And again, I'm sorry that he's he's not on, but nonetheless, this book was is. Um, Incredibly telling. One of the other things that I found very fascinating about the book was uh, there was a revolt on the Senate floor because of the mass manipulation. Because before the Senate takes place in 2014, according to Edward Penton's book, before the, uh, the Senate takes place, there is uh, sort of an introductory document, right? A big, like sort of a, like a teaser document of sorts. It seemed like that got manipulated. Like they took, they they supposedly took all the 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 feedback from all the bishops, and then they synthesized it. But they did it in record time, apparently, and they were able to produce this document in multiple languages and whatever. And then n- nowhere in the document does anybody know who said what, where, and why. So there there was a lot of speculation that this was a pre written, pre formatted document that really didn't take into consideration the, the the concerns of the bishops around the world. And they had it ready to go, especially given the fact that the staff available to make all this happen was rather small. And we can tell you uh, from our perspective how hard it is to do so much with with too few, because that's what we do every day at the Station of the Cross. We do as much as we can with as few people as possible. We, We need as much help as we can get, but nonetheless, here we are. So how do they get that done? How were they able to accomplish that? How were they able to synthesize the mountain of information so fast as to have a completed document with multiple language translations to boot? Seems rather suspicious. So there was that. 
Then there was the manipulation during the Senate, the controlling of the conversations. And then what gets reported to the to the media doesn't seem to be in keeping with the actual uh, conversations that are happening on the floor. And then there's the, you know, instrumentum laborious that seemed to be rigged. And then there was I mean, there, it was just so many examples that this book goes into in detail, uh, keeping you know footnotes and receipts and all the rest. So I encourage you to check it out. But uh, there was a many revolt. Over this manipulation happening on the Senate floor, Cardinal Pell was having none of it. God rest his soul. This guy was having none of it. But what was also very fascinating to me in reading this book was there was another character that was also having none of it. But he wouldn't be somebody that you would say, uh, I would say, was an ally in the fight. Turns out Cardinal Whirl, of all people, Cardinal Whirl had a big problem with the mass manipulation, because there were bishops pushing back and they were trying to get their their version of what was going on in the Senate and the conversations being had out to the public. But they've, the Vatican Communications Office wasn't wasn't publishing it. Father Rasika, formerly of salt and light fame, Father Rasika, who at this time back in 2014 and 2015 was standing there at all these press briefings and he was controlling the narrative and by, by the way, Father Rosica has been de- since uh, defunct because it turns out he was a big time plagiarizer. Turns out he lied about degrees and all kinds of things. And um, and this time he was he was control. He wanted the press to think that the normalization of same sex unions, divorce and remarried communion, and all the rest, the embracing of this ideology, was somehow widely accepted. Turns out it wasn't at all. And even Cardinal World got upset by that. Let that sink in for a sec. Yikes. Hey, coming up after the break, I want to share with you what Father Murray had to say about this synod that we're dealing with now. So many parallels, so many, uh, so many, so many overlapping going on. So I'm going to share that with you coming up after this break. Again, we'll have to get Edward Penton rescheduled. He's probably tied up in a something to do with the synod itself. So don't go anywhere. More a Catholic take is coming up next. Hear what listeners are saying about the free iCatholic Radio mobile app. Through the iCatholic Radio app, I have listened to the sermons and teachings several times. The effect has been a deeper understanding of my faith and Catholic tradition. This app has truly been a blessing in my life and has increased my faith. Listen live or at your convenience to your favorite shows. Just search for iCatholic Radio in your app store today. Speed of Jesus Christ, welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Hey, by the way, today we're back to our normal scheduled programming, which means at the top of the hour, we're going to say goodbye to the radio audience. We'll stay on for the live after show. We're having another, we're having a, an after show. It's been a week since we've had an after show. I'm very much excited about that and getting to hang out and talk to you directly, get your thoughts, your opinions on anything and everything you really, really want. The inside was hanging out this morning. Really appreciate seeing you guys on Telegram. Praise be to God. I see lots of people hanging out on YouTube this morning. Robert DeBruce is here over on the Rumbles as well. Patty and the team over uh, Mary Corso and Junior Barr and Isabel. Good morning to you guys. Uh, by the way, Keith, uh, reinstate Catholic. Good morning to you. Uh, Epo Rose One and Dave M and so many others hanging out with us this morning. We'll be able to chat in the after show. So if you want to be a part of that and you're listening on iCatholic Radio or you're, or you're listening on the radio, it's stationofthecross.com forward slash A. CT is a great place to go to find the live video feed and places where you might be able to comment there. But uh, at any rate, there uh, here's a story I saw that I found uh, very interesting. Father Murray, who's been a guest on this program before, says Pope Francis Synod on the Synodality could cause immense harm to the church. In the last segment, I was talking about Edward Penton's book published by Ignatius. We'll put a link to it in the show notes. Uh, there's so many parallels, so many crossovers, so many... Um, you might say that, was that a warm-up act back in 2014, 2015? Are we seeing uh, the road being paved 
for what is is happening today. So many people think so. Maybe you don't. Maybe you're on the team that says, "No, Joe, you guys are being crazy." Maybe that. Maybe that's your 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 uh, your side of the argument. But nonetheless, very smart, very intelligent people, very highly trained, very qualified people, very sober, very rational people are saying otherwise. And that is a point that I kind of want to illustrate and bringing this up about Father Murray. Father Murray is not some, uh, you know, explosive, you know, Joe McClain choleric personality where, you know, like he's, he's, not, he's, he's a canon lawyer. He thinks very rationally. He's a very sober kind of person. And he's, he's, um, he doesn't lack charity. Trust me on that. So let me just go through a little bit of this article for you. And I want you to keep all of that in mind. A respected canon lawyer and regular EWTN commentator has issued a canonical critique of the Synod on Synodality and warned that by allowing lay people to vote, the event could cause immense harm to the life and mission of the church. Father Gerald Murray, JCD, made his comments at a recent conference in Rome held on the eve of the Synod on Synodality where he was joined on the speaker table by Cardinal Raymond Burke and Professor Stefano Fontana. Father Murray's talk given in Italian is available in English. We're going to again link to this article in the show notes. While we're while known more commonly as the Synod on Synodality, the Synod is technically and officially denoted by the Vatican as the 16th Ordinary General Assembly of the Synod of Bishops, but it includes lay folk too, as well as uh, non-bishops. As the name denotes, a synod is comprised of bishops and is clearly defined as such in canon law. But as Father Murray noted on April the 26th, Pope Francis bent this rule, allowing men who are not bishops and women to participate as voting members in a synod for the first time. The pontiff announced it would. The pontiff announced it to the world via a press release from the media office of the general secretariat of the synod. As such, the episcopal and hierarchical nature of the synod of bishops effectively came to an end with this unsigned document from the press office of the general secretariat of the synod that announced the extension of participation in the synodal assembly to non-bishop members. Said Murray. Murray argued that even the process by which this change was effected was wrought with errors. He noted that the press release, which which was um, with which announced the introduction of lay voting members, had no citation of a papal decree which enacted the change. While Canon 51 demands a decree is to be issued in writing, Murray added that I am not aware that such a decree has been published and thus The reference in the Senate press release document to a papal approval of a change to existing canonical provisions is not sufficient to establish legal certainty in this matter. So what what is the deal here? Why why is Father Murray making such making such an an argument out of what seems so very technical? And I guess this is part of the problem. This is part of the pushback that we're seeing on the Senate. Something I mentioned last week when Cardinal Zen brought this up, which, by the way, I'm going to have a guest on this week who is in direct communication with Cardinal Zen, and we'll talk about this more in particular. So that'll either happen tomorrow or Wednesday. Um, But nonetheless, because we're seeing so many irregularities, so many people, so many sober-minded, well-balanced people, no, not rad trads, okay, not radical traditionalists, very even-keeled Nova Soto uh, priests are bringing up big issues. Why is this a big issue? Because there seems to be a push to say, uh, well, we should follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Diane Montaigne on Friday, I put a video out. I put a a short vertical video on the channel uh, on Friday about this. Diane Montaigne asked a cardinal, a representative of of the synod, what defines, how do you know, how can you be sure that the conclusions you seem to be coming to are inspired of the Holy Spirit? To which the cardinal responded, or maybe it wasn't a cardinal, I'll have to go back and look, but it was a representative, it was, a, it was a, at least a bishop, who responded by saying, well, I recite the creed. I recite the creed. Uh, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, I'm sorry, I want to be specific here. It wasn't a cardinal and it wasn't a bishop. It was Ralph Feeney. And he said, I recite the creed. We believe 
you know, and then he, he goes on to this sort of mundane, crazy response that doesn't seem to actually answer. It's like a politician. You know, he doesn't he sort of avoids it completely. You know, we just we must we must feel the and, and follow the Holy Spirit. This sort of emotional hogwash, really. That's not definitive. It's not clear. How can you know that things are precise? Because there are precise ways to go about it. And Car- and Father Murray brings these up. Father Murray makes it clear that, well, if this is what the Pope wants to do, he has a mechanism. He should issue this, you know, this official declaration. He should make these official statements. He should follow canon law. And then that helps us to discern definitively this process that you, but you're not doing that. No, instead you go with this, oh, the seat of my pants. Oh, the gut feeling that I have. You know, I'm reminded when I went through Air Force ROTC, Junior ROTC, we would go to these trainings and they would remind us clearly that in when you, you're pursuing your flight training, you can't follow your gut. You can't follow your, your emotions because they will deceive you. And they would demonstrate that uh, not only by citing the statistics of pilots that have died because they didn't follow their instruments. They followed what they were feeling at the time and their feelings deceived them and they would crash into the earth or a mountain or some other place and they would die. And they would lead others there as well, like in the case of the Blue Angels, where they were all led in formation into the earth. Bad things can happen when we sometimes follow our passions, follow our disordered passions, follow our gut feelings, follow our emotions without using rational thought and discernment first. So Diane Montaigne asks this Rofini, hey, how do you know? He gives sort of a hogwash kind of an answer. So she follows up and says, yeah, how do you actually know? That you're following the promptings. How do we know that it's the Holy Spirit saying these things and not some other terrible spirit that might be suggesting these things? How can we know that for sure? To which the response was, hey, thanks for coming, everybody. Have a great day. We have no longer time for questions for you. Father Murray is not a crazy person. Father Murray is not a radical traditionalist. Father Murray is not... Some uh, some bombastic person out there with a bullhorn just trying to stir up trouble. He doesn't have some some hidden agenda that says he wants to take down Pope Francis. That's not Father Murray. It's not at all Father Murray. He is just a Catholic priest, canon lawyer, sober and rational. And he, as well as others, are bringing up big issues. So the attack against those that would bring up these issues can't be, well, you're just out to get so-and-so. That's not true. They have very specific cases, very specific evidences, and very specific arguments. Where's the counter to that? I don't know. Let's talk about it in the after show.